Heavenly Father, I pray, Lord, that you would bless this time, Lord, that you would anoint the words of Father Adam as he preaches, Lord, that the meditation of our hearts, the words of his mouth would be pleasing to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Just briefly, for those of you who don't know who Father Adam Jameson is, I just want to briefly introduce him. Come on up. Um, so uh, Adam and Rachel Jameson, it's been over a year and a half since he preached to an all-white community because they live in West Africa where he uh, serves full-time with Hope Ignited. Uh, I think it's been around a year or more since he was last with us. Uh, we've talked about this, uh, so you might need to you know, help him along with some feedback during his sermon. Uh, it'll make him feel really comfortable, I promise, uh, if you give him some verbal feedback. Now, I'm, I'm really excited that he's here. Um, they're only with us for uh, a few more uh, weeks, a couple more weeks, actually. So we're very thankful to have you here preaching on this passage. Welcome. Thank you. Well, good morning. I guess I can take this off, huh? The only one. Well, yes, Brian, thank you for the, for the introduction. Uh, and we are super excited, my wife and I, to, to be here with you again. We, we do consider Church of the Resurrection our, our home church, so it's always a privilege uh, to get an opportunity to be with you, to worship together with you. As Brian mentioned, uh, my name is Adam Jameson. My wife, Rachel Jameson, uh, is here as well. And we are missionaries uh, with a larger team in a West African, predominantly Muslim country called Guinea. And we are in the process of opening up the country's very first pediatric center of excellence. Um, And that's part of why we're back here this season um, finalizing some fundraising, and we're looking to go back here in just 10 days now uh, to begin construction on that. And we really hope that this center will be an embodiment of Christ's love to the people of Guinea. Uh, and we want to do that by bringing hope and healing to the children of Guinea and to their families. So we're back here again just for a couple of months, and we leave uh, in just 10 days to go back to be with our brothers and sisters in Guinea. Now, technically, we are still in the middle of Christmas season, but Brian has given me a little bit of leeway, some permission to move away from the lectionary just a little bit. I know that makes some of you nervous, but uh, I think we're going to have a good time this morning because I want to talk about what I always talk about. If you've heard me speak, you probably even know what I'm going to tell you. What I want to talk about is that as God's people... As Christians, we are indeed all missionaries. Amen. Amen. <laughs> wow, you see, they see that. I feel good now. We're moving. <laughs> we are all missionaries, which means that we are, as a people, called to be on the move. And as an example, we follow the example of our Lord and Savior who left heaven, came to earth to enter into this broken world that we may find life. And we, too, are called to be on the move, moving into the places in the world that are dark and broken so that people may catch a glimpse of the way, the truth, and the life. That is what it means to be God's people. And in light of this, I want to dissect the story that we heard this morning, the story of Jesus healing this man by the pool of Bethesda. Now, there's a lot going on in this story, so I'm not going to dissect each and every piece of it. And Brian says, I'm on a clock. In Guinea, I can talk for literally hours. It doesn't matter. People take naps. They wake back up, and we, and we keep moving. Uh, but here he tells me, I got like 20 minutes, and you guys are done. So I'll, I'll try to hold to that. But I want us to just look at what does it mean to encounter this person of Jesus, the Word made flesh, specifically through the question, do you want to be made whole? And the command, arise, pick up your mat, and walk. Now, I want us to look at this, and I want us to see the significance of this question and this command in relation to our calling to be sent out into the world as missionaries. But before we do, I'd like to start with some history. 
Um, this passage actually is, is an extraordinary piece of history. And there's some interesting aspects that I want to bring to the surface here. Now, Charles Taylor, some of you may have heard this name. He is a, a preeminent philosopher who wrote a book called The Secular Age. And in this book, he tells us that we're living in a secular age. Now, I know most of you are thinking, yeah, yeah, we got that. We figured that out. We don't need a guy with 35 years of, of experience and a PhD to tell us that. But what is fascinating, he, he said something that has stuck with me for years and years. And he says that in a secular age, we, even the faithful, constantly doubt our own beliefs. And that's part of what it means to live in a secular age, is that literally, even as we sit here and proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ, in the back of our heads, there's significant doubt about the truth that we confess. And, and here we have this book that we live our lives by. And of course, many people, modern scholars specifically, would say this book is nothing more than stories written by some fishermen, people who didn't understand science, didn't understand the modern world. Essentially, it's just legends that larger institutions have now picked up, and, and they tell us these stories so that they can control our morality, right? That's what the church is. We just come in here, we tell you how you're supposed to live so that we can control who you are, what you think, and what you do. And so in light of that, there really is this question always, can this particular book be true? And a few years ago, Brian and I actually had an opportunity to go to Jerusalem together. And, and this is where the pool of Bethesda, the context for our conversation this morning, is. And anyone who goes there can go look at it, can go look at the pool see where it is, and it's an amazing sight. And what's interesting about this is that literally about 60 years ago, maybe 60, 70 years ago, no one had any idea where this pool was located. So you couldn't see it. So most people used this particular passage to, to really call into question the legitimacy of the scriptures. Because they said, here's this guy who says there's a pool of Bethesda, no one's ever seen it. No one has any idea where it is. And he even says it's got five covered porches. Did you guys catch that? Now, most pools are, how many sides does a pool have? Four. Thank you. Four sides. So how in the world is there this weird healing pool that's got five covered porches around it? Certainly, whoever wrote this uh, didn't have any idea what was going on in Jerusalem. There's no way this could be anything other than a story. And about 50, 60 years ago, archaeologists actually discovered this particular pool for the first time. And of course they did. They uncovered it. And sure enough, um, there were not five sides to the pool. But what they did discover was that there was two basins. So essentially one that would kind of set a little bit higher than the other one. So there were four sides, but there was also this section in the middle. So right in between the two pools that actually made up this fifth side, if you will, that indeed had a porch. And so here we have this pool of Bethesda in Jerusalem that sure enough did have five covered porches, and they figured out that it had been buried in about 70 A.D. during the time of the war. So essentially what they argue now is that there's literally no way this person could have had any idea this pool existed, no way he could have known there were five covered porches in this pool unless... He was in Jerusalem before 70 A.D. And I love this story because here we see, okay, now literally the modern scholars and critics who try to call into question the truthfulness and the historical accuracy of this book uh, have now been shamed by this fisherman. And I love that because that's exactly how God works always. He uses the fools of the world to shame the wise. Amen? Amen. 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 All right, so now we're ready. Finally, that's a lot of talking. We're going to move on. Now we know that here's this historically accurate story of Jesus healing a man at Bethesda. And this is the third miracle in the book of John. And if you remember in the book of John, at the very end, John says Jesus performed so many miracles, the world could not even contain the amount of books it would take to write these things down. But he picked seven. Seven specific miracles are what he calls signs because these are more than just miracles. 
right? These are physical miracles where God demonstrates his physical power over the world. But even more than that, these are miracles that point us towards a deeper, more significant spiritual reality. A reality that Jesus actually entered into this world to resolve. So here's Jesus. He's in Jerusalem for a festival. And during this time of celebration, he slowly makes his way to this pool. And this pool had become a a home to a multitude of disabled people. And amongst these people, there was one, the scriptures say, an invalid, a man who was lame and had been laying by this pool for how many years? 38 years. years. So on one hand, this pool is this place of hope. This is a place where people go to find healing because as legend had it, if the waters were actually stirring, without a palpable wind, then the very first person to enter into those waters would find healing. So it's a place of hope. People are coming from all over the place just hoping that they can find their way into the waters and find healing. But of course, at the same time, this guy had been there for 38 years. So you can imagine after a little bit, this place of hope is slowly turning into a place of despair and desperation. And here comes Jesus, and I love this, on the move, constantly on the move, going from this place of celebration, entering into the world of despair, this world of a lack of hope. And he sees this guy, and it says he knows the affliction, and he even knows how long this guy has been there, and he walks up, and he asks a strange, potentially even a condescending question to this man. He says, do you want to be healed? Or more accurately, do you want to be made whole? And it's a fascinating question. I mean, this is a question that, that of course, you're thinking to yourself, wait a sec, this is like a, it's a huge pastoral fail. I mean, why, why would Jesus ask this particular question? If you went to the hospital, you're sick, potentially you've got COVID, we've all heard of this little disease running around, and you got it, you go into the hospital, you're sick, and the first thing the doctor asks you is, do you want to be healed? Do you want to be made whole? You would think, well, yeah, are you joking? I, I, I'm here. I came here to find healing. I'm laying by this pool that is supposed to heal me. Why would you ask me the question, do you want to be made whole? And this question really is more significant than we think. My wife uh, is a pediatric cardiologist. And, and one time I remember asking her very clearly, I was like, honey, why did you choose to be a pediatric cardiologist? And honestly, if I'm honest with you, I just Googled uh, online that adult cardiologists make significantly more money. <laughs> and so I was like, why in the world would you choose to make less money? That's just not a good, wise choice. And, and I remember she, she answered so quickly. She said, well, it's more rewarding because children want to get better. Children want to get better. And I thought, wow. It's so true for many of us. So adults go in with heart disease all the time, and of course they want to be healed, but they're not going to change. They say, fix me, but I'm not changing my diet. I'm not changing my lifestyle. I'm not going to start exercising. I'm going to do me, but just fix me. And we see this all the time, and this is human nature. Make me better, but I'm going to stay exactly where I am. Our brokenness or or even the actions that lead to our brokenness become so much a part of our lives that we can't even imagine making a change. And some of us even begin to find temporary joy in our brokenness or in the things that lead to our brokenness. And we think we'd actually rather hang on to these things than to be healed from them. And if you're anything like me, this, this pandemic has revealed areas in your own life where you simply are not well. And man, I hate it. I don't want to come face to face with all the parts of me that simply are not well. What I want is for the world to just go back to normal. 
I don't want to be healed. I just want to go back to that time period when I can keep living inside this world in this, this fantasy world of illusion where I'm in control because if I believe that, then I can keep my fears, I can keep my anxieties, I can keep all of my sins suppressed and it at bay. I don't want to get healed. I just want things to go back to normal. And in this reality, Jesus is asking us, do you want to be made whole? And it just gets deeper. I mean, think about this guy. He'd been lame for 38 years. And sure, he doesn't want to be lame anymore, but think about the other side of healing. He was comfortable. He'd figured out how to live. In fact, he probably figured out how to make a living off of his maladies. And if he was going to get healed, then all of a sudden, everything changes. All of a sudden, he'd become responsible. He'd been out of the game for 38 years. The guy probably doesn't have a skill that is of any value to the world. And now he's going to have to get up, get healed, and then figure out how to do it all over again. And Jesus asks him, do you want to be made whole? And I know for many of us, I hear this all the time. They say, Adam, I I want to be on mission but I'm just too scared. There's just too much. If I follow Jesus, there's just too much to lose. And we think, look, I've got this world figured out. I know how it works. I know how to make money. I know how to go about doing my business. I know how to be comfortable. I don't want to change. I just really want to come to church and have Father Brian or somebody else make me feel a little bit better about who I am. And that's the reality for so many of us. James Baldwin is an African-American writer who spent most of his adult life in France wrestling with issues of racism and prejudice, and he's quoted saying this. He says, nothing is more desirable than to be released from an affliction, but nothing is more frightening than to be divested of a crutch. His point is this. As human beings, we have a tendency to let our issues define us, So much so that we wouldn't even know who we are if our issues, our sins, our fears, our anxieties, our maladies were to just go away. And so deep down, we simply do not want them to. We end up needing our crutch, so we grow complacent, resistant to change because we don't know what we would do without it. The issue or issues that plague us actually start to define us. They start to control us. And we grow comfortable being the victim of these issues because as the victim, it can always be somebody else's fault. And if it's somebody else's fault, then it's not our responsibility. Listen to the response this lame guy gets. Jesus says, do you want to be made whole? Does he say yes? No. He says, there's actually no one to help me get into the pool. And this person or that person is always getting in before me, standing in my way. The entire system and the entire world is against me. I'm just laying here waiting for a breakthrough. I'm here because somebody put me here, and I'm still here because no one's coming to make a difference. I'm a victim. This has become this man's identity. And don't mishear me. I mean, some of us have legitimate maladies, legitimate sicknesses, physical sicknesses that we may take to our grave. And some of us have gone through things that are completely unspeakable, physical, sexual, mental abuse. Some of us are caught in addictions, fearful that if we lose these things, we're just not going to be able to cope. And these are big, deep issues that oftentimes seem completely insurmountable. And I'm not promising you that God is going to provide you with instantaneous healing. In fact, if you follow him, I can promise you that you will continue to face tribulations and trials. But I can promise you this, the illness, the fear, the anxiety, the sins, the pains, these things do not own you and they do not define you. Because God chooses to meet us in our despair to offer us real healing and a new identity as his child. See, Jesus walked into this man's despair, not because this man was seeking him 
but simply out of compassion. He met this man where he was in the middle of his hopelessness. And contrary to popular view of Jesus in our culture today, he did not just sit down next to this guy all lovey-dovey like and say, hey man, everything's going to be okay. Because he didn't come into this world to make us feel better about ourselves. He came into this world to take the broken things and put them back together. Amen? And in case you're missing it, let me tell you the beauty of the gospel message. It's this. You're not a victim anymore. You're not defined or owned or enslaved by the issues that are binding you, not because you've got some deep southern internal willpower where you can pick yourself up by your bootstraps, but because the God of the universe, made known in the person of Jesus Christ, is breathing life into you. Arise, pick up your mat, and walk. He's saying, what I've done for you is bigger than anything someone or something has done to you. What he's done for us is bigger than anything someone or something has done to us. Arise. That issue, that sin that has plagued you for all these years does not define you. He's saying, I'm your identity now. So get up. Pick up that issue because you're not going back and walk with me into the world as my child. Because as the Father has sent me, now I am sending you. And you may still be carrying that mat out into the world. In fact, I promise you, you will be. And most likely, that is exactly how God is going to use you to transform the life of somebody else. So let me end by pointing out one more beautiful truth. This man was sick for how long? 38 years. 38 years. Now, some commentators will say that that really that's just there to tell you that it's been a long time. The dude has been lame for a long time. Uh, So there it is. He's been sick. There's no way he was going to be healed on his own. They wanted to point out it was long enough that surely it was a miracle that healed this man. But I actually think that there's a deeper meaning to this. And we heard it this morning in our reading in Deuteronomy, although that's a pretty difficult reading to get through, so you may have missed it. So Deuteronomy 2.14. Actually, who's got their Bible? I want someone to read that for me, and then I'll I'll repeat it. Deuteronomy 2.14. All right, read it. All right, so how many years? 38 years. years. And and all of you are thinking, no, wait, I thought that the people of Israel were in the wilderness for 40 years. Everyone knows that. If you've been been in a Bible study at all, you know it was 40 years. Everyone knows it was 40 years. But here we see in the passage, no, wait, it was actually two years after they left the slave, being slaves, two years that they reached the, the border of the promised land. And that's when God said to him, hey, go take your promised land. And you remember what happened. They, they went out, they sent the spies out, but there were giants in the land. And they came back and they're like, there's literally no possible way we can take the land that God has promised us because these giants are absolutely huge. So God said, okay, because you don't have faith in the promises I've made to you, you will now wander in the wilderness. So here it was from that very point, Until this point now, we read in Deuteronomy, it was 38 years that the people of Israel literally just walked in circles, stuck in the middle of this wilderness. And Jesus, to me, is making it abundantly clear. All of us are spiritually crippled. And like this crippled man by the pool, like the people of Israel, we're stuck. We're stuck in our false identities. We're stuck in our fears. We're stuck in our anxieties, our spiritual maladies, and we're helpless. We're in the middle of the wilderness, and there's absolutely no way out. 
But Jesus has come to meet us in this place of hopelessness and give us new life. But if all you see is the giants, if all you see are the issues that are standing in front of you, if all you see are the the reasons why you can't change, then trust me, you're going to miss it. It says there in Deuteronomy, God says to his people, you've skirted the mountain long enough. It's time to turn north. God, with only his word, spoke the world into existence. And through nothing more than his word, arise, pick up your mat and walk. He spoke life into this man. And he's speaking life into you this morning. I don't know what's holding you back. Maybe you've been plagued by something so long you've given up hope. Maybe you're afraid because of the newness and responsibility of a whole life scares you because being sent into the world is a scary thing. But I can tell you firsthand that the hope, the beauty of being a child of God and being used as an instrument by which he makes himself known is greater than anything that may be holding you back. So Church of the Resurrection, 2021 is shaping up to be an exciting year for you individually and collectively because you guys are going to be on the move. And that scares some of you. And if you say it doesn't, then you're lying to me. Some of you are scared. And here we are at the beginning of 2021, and literally this entire country just wants things to go back to normal. The vaccine is coming. Normalcy is ahead of us. We just want to go back to where we're comfortable. Literally, I say we'll be fighting tooth and nail to go lay back down on that mat because at least on that mat, we're comfortable. Don't let that be you. God is speaking life into you this morning individually and collectively, and I promise you that if you get on the move, he's going to do something extraordinary. And you're going to get to be a part of it. So as we come to an end, we are eventually going to ask you guys to stand up, to walk, and to partake of the table of the Lord. And when you do, I want you to take the opportunity to bring your mat with you. And as you partake in the body and the blood of Christ, I pray that you will feel the beauty of what it means to be a child of God, to know that the creator of this universe was broken, that you may be made whole. And I want you to leave this place standing tall in the power of the resurrection, ready and excited to tell people of the good news of the king that has set you free. Church of the Resurrection, do you want to be made whole? Then arise, pick up your mat, and walk. Amen.